Hello, you're listening to On Israel, Al Monitor's podcast. I'm Ben Kaspri from Tel Aviv. A few days ago, Israel suffered the heaviest civilian disaster of its history when 45 men and boys were trampled to death at a religious festival on Mount Meiron in the Galilee. The tragedy happened at uh, the tomb of uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, a Jewish sage who lived about 2,000 years ago and is uh, commemorated annually by hundreds of thousands of ecstatic believers on the Jewish holiday of Lag Baumer. This year's uh, celebration turned into a killing field when severe overcrowding and shoddy security measures set off panic and a deadly stampede. Israel proved once again that when it comes to routine management, to doing things by the book, it just doesn't cut it. Yes, it's a regional power and a global high-tech and cyber leader. It intercepts rockets in mid-flight, launches satellites uh, into space, but it cannot provide safe entry and exit routes for a major festival. This uh, tragedy finds Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at a fateful crossroads. He's trying to form a government after three failed attempts, he's standing trial on corruption charges, and he is desperate to throw cold water on the Biden, Biden administration's enthusiasm for a return to the nuclear deal with Iran. Israel could soon be facing its fifth elections in less than three years. Its governance is collapsing, public trust in its institutions is at record lows, many top government positions are not staffed, awaiting appointments that never come. This chaos is taking a heavy toll. Our guest today is one of the most respected scholars of the decision-making process, specifically of the way decisions are made in the in, uh, interface between the US and Israel governments Professor Chuck Freilich was Israel's deputy national security advisor. He is a longtime senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center. He teaches political science at Columbia, NYU, and Tel Aviv universities, and he is the author of numerous studies, books, and opinion pieces. His latest book, How the Startup Nation Became a Global Cyber Power, will be published later this year. We will be here with uh, Professor Freilich after this short break. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East. And if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform, on Israel with Ben Caspit and on the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Now I'm privileged to say hello uh, to my colleague, Professor uh, uh, Freilich, uh, Chuck Freilich, uh, and welcome uh, to our podcast on Israel in Al Monitor. Shalom, Chuck. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with the catastrophe on Meiron. This site is second only to Jerusalem's Western world in terms of its importance to Jews. It is managed by various religious groups and isn't under any government oversight. In fact, it has become a kind of ex-territorial enclave and uh, the government is reluctant to tangle with the politically powerful, the ultra-Orthodox groups that run the place. As one who has analyzed the decision-making process in Israel and was even part of uh, the system, how do you view this collapse of Israel's governance in major arenas of public life? Well, I think you've 
given part of the answer in your question. I think the tragedy here is the result of five related failures. And one is the fact that the top political leadership, the prime minister, the minister of uh, the interior, Mr. Derry of Shas and uh, his colleague from Shas, the minister of religious affairs and the minister of domestic security, Mr. Ohana, all pressed all out to hold this uh, festival with, without any restrictions on numbers. Uh, they're all, of course, now doing their best to avoid taking any responsibility. And they pressed for this despite the fact that the dangers were well known, despite the, the dangers uh, related to COVID. That's one failure. The second failure is that what happened here reflects the ongoing hollowing out and cowing of Israel's professional bureaucracy, the governmental bureaucracy, by the prime minister and other leaders. We saw this in the COVID crisis. Um, we saw it in the abysmal performance of the ministries of education and health in recent years. And we saw it now um, with the domestic security ministry as well. The third failure is of Israel's electoral system. And it's absolutely clear that the system has not been performing adequately uh, for decades. There have been lots and lots of failures. Now, I'm not just a blind supporter of electoral reform. Even if we change the system, every system has its failures, but it's time to do away with this one. The fourth failure is one of the Haredi community, the ultra-Orthodox community. Uh, I don't know if I should call this Pearl Harbor or Yom Kippur, but for the, that's what it is for the Haredi community. And the question is whether they really do some serious soul searching and make some changes. Um, I must say I'm not optimistic, but uh, this is really the time for them to do so. And finally, let me say, uh, and I say this with great pain, what we saw in Miron is an indication, I think, of what we have in store for ourselves in Israel in coming decades, because by 2060, a third of the Jewish population will be Haredi. And these are people, many of whom, of course, not all, many of whom view the state as an enemy. They refuse to obey its laws, even basic safety re regulations for their, for their own benefit, for their own health. We saw it in the COVID crisis, we saw it now people who violate just basic laws continually. We see a level of population among the Haredi community that is at the level of a third world country. And if we don't change the demographic trends um, and we don't have a lot of time left to do it, Israel's economic future is engraved out and our social future, our future as an entire nation is engraved out. You know, this, uh, we call it the, the, the shtetl system of the Haredi community, that they, they, and they, uh, a lot, uh, many times they, they just take care of one another uh, in, uh, with all these tzedaka uh, uh, organizations. is actually, you know, in, in routine it works, but how can you affect it? How can you change the demographics in a democratic state? Well, first of all, uh, we could have a government which cuts back government transfer payments to the Haredi community. Actually, Mr. Netanyahu did so when he was Minister of uh, yes. the Treasury about 12 years ago, and we saw an immediate drop in birth rates. So that could happen again. And if we now see an alternative coalition without the Haredim, or in which the Haredim are not the kingmakers as they have been for the last decade or, and more, then maybe there is some hope. In the final analysis, the non-Haredi community is the majority in the state of Israel. And if we change the electoral system, and maybe even if we don't, if we start manifesting our numbers and force a change, we can force a change. And my last question about this uh, disaster uh, during the weekend is how, what, what should we do now in order to to, to find or, to, or how can anyone be held accountable of such a tragedy when it takes a place within such chaos in a vacuum of governance and organization? Well, of course, in the short term, nothing is gonna happen. Certainly not in the next few days and probably in the next few weeks as the coalition talks play out. 
And by that time, the impetus for actually doing something may dissipate as well. I would hope that that's not the case. 45 people were killed uh, for absolutely no reason. This is, I called it before Yom Kippur, or Pearl Harbor, whatever. This is really one of our low points as a nation. And if we don't do something about this, that would be tragic. I totally agree with you. And tell me, uh, Professor uh, uh, Freilich, in general, how do you see the political anarchy that has been uh, paralyzing Israel for over two years and its impact on decision making, especially on the critical Jerusalem-Washington axis? Well, first of all, the political crisis as a whole is simply untenable. It's undermining just about everything in Israeli life. Uh, the economy is in bad shape. Um, social tensions are, are probably worse than they've ever been. And I think the ongoing, the cumulative impact on our national security is also beginning to be significant because it's not as if the Iranians and Hamas and Hezbollah are just sitting uh, and waiting for us to get our house uh, in order. This can't continue. Now, in terms of the relationship with Washington, the, the problem is much deeper than the last two years. That's added to it. But there are major developments underway in the United States, some related to our behavior, our policies, some totally unrelated, that are already having a significantly deleterious effect on the bilateral relationship. In the last three years or so, we have seen not a minor fluctuation, but a simple collapse of support for Israel uh, on the part of the Democratic Party, especially the further left part of the party. But overall, it's, it's a collapse. It's not a drop. We have seen a drop of support in the Jewish community, especially among younger people. Now, it's not a question of Israeli special relationship, was that it was always bipartisan. And here the prime minister does bear significant responsibility for making Israel become a partisan issue in the United States. And I hope that that's something that will change whoever the next prime minister is. We cannot afford to lose the Jewish community. That's the pillar of the relationship. We can't afford to lose the Democrats. We need support of the entire American electorate. There are also long-term demographic processes underway in the US, and these are the ones that are unrelated to Israel, but have a direct effect. For example, the two most rapidly growing population groups in the United States today are Hispanics and the religiously unaffiliated. In other words, people who don't, uh, have a distinct religious identity. Now, it's not that these two communities are anti-Israel, they just don't have much to do with Israel. This, the Hispanics in particular don't have much to do with us. And the, uh, we know that there is a strong correlation between religiosity and support for Israel. So if the, the non-religious community, the, the totally un unidentified um, community is growing, that's gonna have an unavoidable effect on the impact. We don't have a lot of time to ensure the long-term longevity of this relationship. It's rapidly approaching a crisis point. So we have to change it, the, the directions now. And if Israel, if I very much hope we don't, but if the prime minister decides to challenge the Biden administration in any way like he did the Obama administration, that's gonna bring this crisis forward very rapidly. Yes, uh, I, I, again, I, I agree with you 100%. And I want now to go to a, to a more specific issue, the, the Iranian issue. And you recently wrote an article together with the former Mossad director, Efraim Alevi, and former military intelligence commander, Zev, Aaron Zevi Farkash, on what Israel should be doing to maximize its influence on the Iran nuclear issue without damaging its relations with the US. How do you view Israel's most critical mistakes in this arena? Well, I think the most critical mistake was coming out against the Obama administration 
and doing so in the way the prime minister did, which was almost like taking on the president, challenging him for a duel at the OK Corral. It's one thing to express disagreement quietly behind the scenes, even very strong disagreement. And if there is any issue that would justify public criticism, well, the Iranian issue, which is either, depending on your point of view, uh, an existential threat or a potentially existential threat, there's no doubt that it's a dire threat to Israel. Well, that would be the appropriate issue on which to air differences publicly, but not to take the president on in Congress. I think that was our biggest mistake. And as I said, I truly hope it won't happen again. I think you mentioned a few uh, steps that Israel should, uh, should do or, or points or strategic uh, assumptions in this article. Can you repeat uh, part of it for, for us? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, we have to adopt a policy of strategic patience. I think that's true in regard to the Iranian issue and it's regard to other threats as well. The fact is Iran isn't yet at a, they haven't achieved a military nuclear capability yet. They're a good two years away from it, from the moment that they make the political decision to try and break out to a bomb. Yeah. Now, it's been a good, over a decade that they could have made that political decision and they haven't. And that's a success of American policy, Israeli policy, of the international efforts to prevent them from going nuclear because the Iranians came to the conclusion, not that they don't want to go nuclear, but to do so in that way would simply be too costly. Second of all, maximal coordination with the United States. Now that doesn't mean 100% agreement, but it means coordinating policy to the extent that we possibly can. Third, it means supporting the US in its efforts to return to the nuclear deal, the so-called JCPOA, not because it's a perfect deal, it isn't, it's a problematic deal, but for two reasons. A, it's probably the best of the bad alternatives uh, that we face. It was so, I believe, in 2015 when it was signed, and I still believe that that's the case today. And in any event, because the administration's going there. So the alternative is to work with them and try and shape the return a little bit or come out against them. I already said that I don't think that that's the right way to go about things. The opponents of the agreement have created a straw man, a, a false dichotomy between the old agreement and a good agreement. That's not the case. The choice is between the old agreement and no agreement. And yes, there are faults, there are major flaws in this agreement, but the alternative no agreement would be much worse. I think we can leverage the newly emerging relations with the UAE and other Arab countries. We have peaceful relations with a half a dozen Arab countries today. We have relations with others under the table. We can work with them. We should continue, of course, covert operations in the meantime. Whether Israel did the Natanz attack or not, whoever did it, that's the type of thing that we should continue to be doing. We have to ensure that we have the military ability to attack the nuclear program should the day come when we have no choice. And finally, I think it's critical that we also have a just about nationwide uh, shield in the face of the missile and rocket threat. I want to, to go deeper in one issue that you, you already touched in our conversation and to ask you, uh, to what extent do you think Netanyahu's total identification with President Trump and the Republicans has damaged Israel's strategic ties with the United States and especially the traditional bipartisan support uh, of Israel in Washington? And is it reversible? I think there's no doubt that it caused severe damage. Now, I think of course the prime minister was right in wanting to have a close relationship with President Trump. I would, have, I would think that any prime minister would want to have a very good relationship with whichever president, a Democrat, Republican uh, is in office. That's the way things should be done. But Mr. Netanyahu created the impression that he was one-sided in this, and, and he really was cozying up to the Republican Party in 
an unprecedented way and in a way which was just inappropriate. That's something which is not irreversible, but if he comes out again against the Biden administration in the way he did against the Obama administration, there's gonna be a crisis with the Democrats. They're still steaming over what happened with President Obama. They're furious over the Palestinian issue. How can we support Israel billions and billions of aid? And on the issue, Israel goes its own course, uh, ignores us completely. And there was even talk, as much as people understand Israel's deep, deep concern about the Iranian issue, the prime minister gave some indications in recent months, and we also heard from the chief of staff and other officials, there were indications that maybe Israel was gonna really try and take on the Biden administration like it did with Obama. If that happens, the crisis is going to be very, very soon. And nothing's irreversible in life, but we're getting there. You've written extensively about Israel's perception of uh, its national security, including, I think, your last book. Uh, can Israel afford for uh, Iran to be a nuclear threshold or nuclear capable uh, power? I think that we have to do everything possible to prevent Ar Iran from going nuclear. First of all, we have to do it diplomatically and through economic sanctions, and Iran isn't there yet. Iran could have crossed the threshold by 2010 or earlier, but as I was saying before, the pain associated with doing it uh, in the face of pretty much a united international community was just too heavy. So they decided to postpone not to give up the program. I think we have to continue playing for time. Hopefully something, may, something good may happen in the course of this period. I believe that in the final analysis, if push comes to shove, if Iran is about to cross the threshold, no, I don't think Israel can allow that to happen. And we will have to do everything in our power to prevent it. I do not believe that military action will gain us a lot of time, eh, two, three years if we're lucky, I'm not convinced it'll be that. That's not a, an optimistic scenario. And of course the blowback will be very significant, but we cannot allow Iran to cross that threshold. And if we act once, we might have to do so again in the future. Yes, it's not uh, very optimistic. And also, you know, uh, uh, unlike the, the, the two previous cases of uh, Arab countries that are trying to get nuclear, like Iraq and Syria, uh, when Israel in these two cases uh, just bombed the, the, the reactors and destroyed them, uh, in, in the Iranian case, it's not a reactor uh, nuclear program. It's infrastructure very deep, very far. You need to be a superpower in order to, to destroy it. And Israel is not yet a superpower. No, we're not yet. And there is some possibility that that won't happen in the immediate future. <laughs> yes. Um, you're right. Absolutely right. Then. Do, do you agree with the assessment of many former and current senior Israeli security experts that Israel does not face any real threats to its existence? Yes, very much so. And, I, and we wrote that in the recent article. I've written it in the past. Look, it's not as if we don't face some severe threats. Hezbollah is a severe threat. A nuclear Iran would be an absolutely dire threat. But people just look at the other side and we look with fear, ju justifiable fear. I'm a party to that fear as well. But we also have to look at our own capabilities. Israel is a regional superpower. We are the most powerful player in the region. We have various capabilities that we know of and various capabilities that have been attributed to the state of Israel. I think the good news, uh, the state of Israel was established so that no one could ever again threaten the Jewish people with destruction. The good news is we crossed that, that point and no one can do so. It's a huge success of the state of Israel, of the IDF. It's a success that we achieved with a great deal of support from our friends in the United States. It's something that we can rejoice in. And we just celebrated uh, Independence Day, Yom Smote a few weeks ago. 
something we can be very proud of. Finally, uh, Professor Chuck Freilich, uh, what is your upcoming book dealing with? It's Israel and the cyber threat, how the startup nation became a global cyber power. It's the story of how Israel has responded to the cyber threat, um, both on a socioeconomic level, building a really remarkable national cyber ecosystem. Israel is today second only after the United States in a center of cybersecurity R&D and the cybersecurity industry. And it's also the story about how Israel has addressed the threats themselves, building up both the state institutions to defend the civil sector and what the IDF and other defense organizations have done to protect us on a defensive level and of course to develop offensive cyber capabilities. The book will be done in another couple of months. Um, it is by far the most comprehensive treatment of this topic. And I think we have a great story here to tell here. I think people will find it interesting. So I'll keep my right to, to call you here again to our podcast uh, about Israel. And in the right. meantime, It was fascinating. I thank you very much, Professor Chuck Freilich, for this conversation in, on Israel. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back uh, right after this short break. Wait for us. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of the award-winning media news site, El Monitor, where we cover the Middle East with some of the best reporters and columnists anywhere. And I'm excited to announce our new podcast, On the Middle East, where each week I will interview newsmakers from the U.S. and the region about the latest news and trends with additional commentary from our on-the-ground correspondents. Those of you who follow the region know that what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And to cite another great movie line, every time the U.S. tries to get out, the region pulls us back. Your time is valuable, so let me promise you this. You will learn something and you will never be bored. because each week we'll be talking with and listening to those leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in this critical and fascinating region. So please subscribe to On the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Thank you for staying with us. I think it was a very interesting conversation with a real uh, uh, and renowned expert. And I think the core issue that we touched is the, the collapse of uh, Israel's governance. And Professor Freilich said that this tragedy is a result of uh, five related failures. The first is uh, the top political leadership, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, Minister Derry of the Interior, and the Minister of Domestic Security, Ohana, they all pressed all out to hold this festival in Lag Baomer without any restrictions on numbers. And now they are trying to avoid any responsibility. The second is the on, uh, ongoing hollowing out of Israel's uh, professional bureaucracy. The third is Israel's electoral systems failure, and I think we've uh, been touching this uh, point in many of, of our, uh, our previous uh, podcasts. The fourth is the Haredi community. This was, uh, according to Professor Feilich, a Yom Kippur or a Pearl Harbor of this community, and they really need to do some serious soul searching. And eventually... Uh, the whole situation, there is indications that by 2060, a third of the Jewish population in Israel will be Haredi. And this will have a huge strategic effect, and we have to, to change, says uh, uh, Professor Feilich, uh, somehow the demographic trends. According to Professor Freilich, the, the political crisis in Israel as a whole is uh, simply untenable. And undermining everything else, it starts to be significant even on our national security issues. Another serious warning that, uh, that uh, we just heard from the professor is that uh, in the last three years, 
there is a collapse of support for Israel in the Democratic Party, especially the far left of this party, and also in the Jewish community, the American Jewish community. And it's not a drop, he said, it's a collapse. And when uh, we spoke about uh, the relationship between the White House and the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem, Professor Freilich said that uh, it is rapidly approaching a crisis point. And if Prime Minister Netanyahu decides to challenge the Biden administration in uh, any way that he did with the Obama administration, it's going to bring this crisis forward very rapidly. I think this is enough for one podcast. I hope you uh, enjoyed it and uh, hope to see you here next Monday in uh, On Israel in Al Monitor. I'm Ben Kaspit from Tel Aviv. Take care.